welcome back to our channel. I'm Nikki, but there's no Rachel today, and we, of course, are the Stitch Sisters. So I'm back today with another video because a while back you might have remembered that I did a tutorial on how to do an English paper piecing quilt and how to sew those little hexagons together to make yourself a big quilt top. Now I've been asked for ages now for a few, from a few of you to do a second tutorial to show you how to finish the quilt. And I needed to get to the point where I had a quilt top finished so that I could show you guys. So we're finally there. I've got a quilt top finished and ready to go. I've done all the prep and I'm going to show you how to take it forward and finish your quilt. So what you're going to need is you're going to need your finished quilt top. So this is the one that I've got finished here, which is one of my scrap quilts. It's in a one inch hexagon and it is quite big. You'll see it spread out in a moment, but it is quite a big one. It's kind of a double to king size kind of size and it's all scraps and I love scrap quilts. They are my absolute favourites. I love just piecing the pieces together and not worrying about following a pattern or anything like that. So you'll need your quilt top. You will also need your wadding. So this will be wadding, whether it's polyester wadding or bamboo wadding, whatever kind of wadding you usually use for a quilt. Now, I prefer polyester wadding because I do make quite a few quilts, or at least I used to, and I found it was more economical to buy a big roll of polyester wadding, which I could use on all my quilts. Sometimes bamboo wadding and cotton wadding and things like that can be very expensive. But whatever you choose, whatever's right for you, go for that. Then you'll need some kind of fabric for the back. And I have just taken a single Ikea duvet cover and I've chosen one that was the same on the front and the back. And I've opened it up and I've opened the whole thing up and that's going to be big enough for my quilt. So you can buy fabric, which is cotton that you can buy on the meter which is extra wide but again it does seem to be quite expensive so duvet covers are a really good way of getting big expanses of fabric which you can either just use unjoined or you can use both pieces to create your backing piece whatever is best for you it really doesn't matter so have some kind of cotton fabric for the back whether that's pieced or one whole piece it doesn't matter so what we're going to need additionally is we're going to need a little pair of scissors and embroidery floss. This is for tying the quilt, which is what I do instead of actually quilting it on the machine. So let me explain all about that now. So the difference between an English paper piecing quilt, which has been hand sewn, and a normal pieced quilt, which has been pieced on the machine, is that you really don't want to have big straight lines of stitching through the English paper piecing. Because as you can see, there's lots and lots of tiny pieces here. And I, for one, have always just felt that straight lines through it just wouldn't have kind of accentuated the hand sewnness of the quilt. And I was always looking for something, another way to quilt it. Then I found a traditional way of quilting. It was called hand tying. And this is where you use something like a embroidery floss or even a wool or something like that to come through all three layers, come back up and then you basically tie a knot. So the quilt is quilted by holding all three pieces together with these little ties. Now, again, you can put in as many ties as you want. If you were doing a quilt that had flower motifs on it or something like that, you could hand tie through the center of each flower. But what I tend to normally do, because a lot of my quilts are scrap quilts, is I tend to kind of do it down in rows. So I tend to do like every third or fourth row and every fourth or fifth hexagon across. And I'll make sure that I change a position across the quilt so that you've got an even quiltedness with the hand ties throughout the whole quilt. What you don't want to do is kind of end up with rows of hand ties coming in the, in the same place all the way down the quilt. What you really want to do is juxtaposition them so that they are spreading the weight out and everything like that. Um, I have, I prefer, much prefer embroidery floss to do this with. I have done it previously with wool and I've had mixed results with wool. Some wools have been fine. Other wools have kind of 
almost frayed and kind of disintegrated. I think it was, the, it might have been like a shiny wool. It might have been something that had a little bit of polyester in it or something like that. So it didn't kind of sit very well. It went really fluffy and then the ties started to actually come undone. Um, but what I've found is that the embroidery floss, because it's strong and is flexible, but also it holds a knot really well. So it is it is ideal for this, but you can use wool. Experiment yourself. If it's something that you've, you've got some wool that you think would be fine, go ahead and hand tie it. The worst thing that might happen is that in a couple of years, you might need to re-hand tie it. It certainly wouldn't fall apart within the first year. Um, I've had the very first quilt I ever made, I hand tied with wool. And after about five years of washing and using every year, the ties started to come apart because the wool just wasn't standing up to the amount of use. So I just undid each hand tie individually and then retied it with embroidery floss. So there's no great uh, amount of work that needs to be done if you have to re-hand tie a quilt. It's fairly easy and it's quite, it's, it's quite a therapeutic thing to do. You're just taking one out and putting a new one in. Um, so you don't have to take the whole quilt apart. Right, so that's all the things you will need. The first thing you need to do is we need to prepare our quilt top. So if your quilt top is finished, you should be at the stage where all of your hexagons are sewn together, all of your basting stitches and papers have been removed, except around the very edge of the quilt, the very extreme edge of the quilt. We want to keep those in place. And I've tried doing this a couple of different ways. Um, I've tried uh, taking out those, those, those paper pieces at the very edge and just leaving the whole thing to kind of uh, go wild. <laughs> but I found it gets really messy at the edges and the, the, the fabric, because it's no longer attached to something all the way around, doesn't hold its shape very well. So uh, uh, what I find best to do is I put a zigzag or a straight stitch through the very edge of the quilt. So let me just show you this, but I'll get some pictures that will show you that I've done a straight stitch right the way around the edge. And you can see some of those stitches are not, you can see there's a little gaps in the stitches and things like that, but that's fine. Once the whole thing is, is attached to the backing and it's been bound, that will all hold together. It's just because that I've cut through the paper. And once you've done that straight stitch, this is, I'm doing this straight stitch or a zigzag stitch with the papers already in the fabric. So I haven't removed those excess, um, so I haven't removed the edge of papers all the way around the edge. I've left those in and then I've straight stitched all the way around the quilt. Now you will have some edges or you should have some edges which are straight. You may have, they may not be, but some edges will be straight like that. And you can see that what I've done is I've just chosen a point and it's usually just before the hexagon would, would change direction. So I'm cutting off those little pointy bits on the edge of the hexagon, making a nice straight edge. Then you may have edges like this one, which are um, different. So you've got a full hexagon here, a half hexagon, then it's a full hexagon and they are you will have hexagons coming out here and you won't have so much of a straight edge. Again, what I've done is I've just chosen to use the straight stitch a quarter of an inch in from the edge of the straight hexagons. So I hope you can see that there. That's just creating my line. So it's making sure that I get a straight line and that I'm following it and I'm not coming at a funny angle or curving or doing anything like that. Again, I'm stitching straight through the paper. Once the stitching is done, you can then go back and take out your basting stitches. Once the basting stitches have come out, you can remove your papers. And what I tend to do is I tend to snip through, so cut off the excess that's on the other side of the stitching, leaving yourself a quarter of an inch seam allowance. This will then release the edge and it will make sure that you can actually get into the back of the hexagon to take the paper out. Occasionally, you might need to snip 
a little bit of the back of the fabric here because it, the, the fold over may be connected in with the straight stitch that you've done. That's absolutely fine. You're just basically releasing it to get the paper out. And the stitches that you've put through should perforate the paper. Now, what I will say is you don't have to be completely perfect with this, okay? You have to be gentle taking the paper out, so tearing it away from the stitches. And I usually hold the stitches while I pull the paper away. That gives it a little bit more of um, force to be able to pull it away, but you don't need to remove every single scrappy bit of paper. It will be absolutely fine. Most of this is going into the edge. And to be honest, as long as I take it out in the actual quilt side, I don't worry quite so much about the other side. I do my best, but I don't worry about it. Okay, so once that's done, we're ready to put the sandwich together and we're ready then to look at our hand ties. So let me show you that. Okay, so I've laid everything out on the floor and I just wanted to show you something before we went any further. So underneath here, I have my backing fabric and I'm laying it out with the right sides out. So there's no turning or anything like that when it comes to this quilt. Everything should be as it will be when finished. So we're now looking at the back of the fabric. So the right side of the fabric is to the carpet. Then on top, we've got the wadding. And as you can see, I have sewn three wadding pieces together to make it big enough. And what I tend to do is I tend to do the biggest zigzag stitch I can on my machine. And I do an ever so slight overlap with just putting both layers together so that they're matching and then zigzag stitch to hold everything together. It's not always perfect. There is occasionally a little bit where you miss, but that's absolutely fine. Don't You don't have to be too perfect with it. So I'm just gonna straighten all of this out and then put my quilt top on top, right sides up. So here she is. She's all laid out. And what you can see here is I've got an edge all the way around the quilt, about five or six inches on each side, just to make sure that if there's any movement, I don't run out of backing fabric and I don't run out of wadding. So I'll give you a closer look. That's Maisie barking, you can all hear. She wants to come in and jump on the quilt. <laughs> so there it is, all laid out, ready to be quilted. So now that everything's laid out in the floor, nice and flat, we need to do some initial pinning. You can just use ordinary pins. You can use quilter safety pins, which are a bit wider on the bottom, or you can just use safety pins, whatever is best for you. We don't need to pin the whole thing. What I just want you to do is to pin, say the first eight inches on one side. And I usually start on one of the shorter sides. What we're gonna do is we're going to pin the top six or eight, 10 inches, something like that. That's just a big chunk of the first edge of the quilt. Pin that together and then we're going to use the hand ties to hold everything together. And we will work down the quilt going from the top to the bottom. So this, instead of kind of quilting evenly across the quilt, which is what you would normally do with a, a quilt that's done on the machine, what the way I find it much easier to do is to do one edge and work my way down. This means that I get less ripples because I can hold it up, I can pull the weight of it down, it's attached at one side and I can just straighten out and only working on that six or eight inches, spreading everything out, spreading it evenly as I go. So I find that's the much easier way to do it. And I just noticed a little Maisie behind me. <gasps> <laughs> she obviously heard me saying her name. So let me show you how to do the pinning first. Okay, so I hope you can see okay here. But what I've done is I've put some of my quilters pins on the uh, on the, the actual quilt and I'm just going to start popping them in. I'm going to start from one corner, going through getting all three layers, making sure not to get the carpet and then I'm just going to work my way across. Hold on, let me just pop that down so that you can see. So I'm going to work in a straight line and I'm just going to smooth the quilt out as I go. Just putting some quilt pins in and then shifting it across. 
So I've just come all the way across and what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten the quilt out once, every, once this first layer of anchoring pins is in position. And as you can see, I'm not taping it down. I'm not doing anything like that that you would sometimes do with other quilts. I'm just letting the pins do the work for now. Right. Now that that's in position, you can see the whole thing has shifted ever so slightly in that direction. So what I'm going to now do is I'm going to put a second layer of pins in and then I'm going to straighten the whole rest of the quilt out. So I will do that and come back to you. So we've got our pins in place now and part of the reason I like to do this method is that you don't really need to worry about whatever's happening on the rest of the quilt. You can just concentrate on this top edge, getting that nice and taut, getting it to go straight and then you can work your way down the quilt. Once the ties are in the top half, you're going to repin the next six or eight inches, then do that part. So with the ties, what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of go every three or four rows and I'm going to go maybe every five or six hexagons. So I'll start tying and I'll make my decision as I go. I've threaded up my needle and needle wise, you want something which is long and pointed, but has a big enough eye so that you can get your chosen tying thread through whether it's embroidery floss or whether it's wool um, very often if it's a very big eye it tends to be a blunt needle it's more of a darning needle but um, if you're using embroidery floss you can usually find needles with a large eye that are still pointed okay so I've got a good length here kind of an arm's length and I folded it over but I haven't tied a knot in the end we don't need to tie a knot in the thread we just want it doubled over okay so I'm going to start I'm just going to pick a hexagon that you guys can see really well. So I'm going to choose this one here because it's a nice white one on the background. And we're going to start with our needle at the top of the quilt. Now, to be honest, I don't normally do this on the floor. I usually do it on my knee, so I have got more access. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop my left hand underneath the quilt so that I can feel the needle. OK, so I'm going to go right the way down in the middle off my hexagon. So I'm going down and I'm just going to pull it through until my thread gets to maybe about, I don't know, three or four inches of a tail. So I hope you can see that tail there. So once you've got that tail, you then just want to turn your needle round and you want to come back up adjacent to where you went down. You don't want to come back up the exact same hole because that will just possibly pull the thread out. Now you'll get the hang of this. It doesn't have to be like millimeter close. It just has to be close enough. So that's maybe about two millimeters away. And I'm popping the needle back up and I'm just going to give it a pull. And that will have created a stitch on the back. So it should be a nice flat stitch without any, any knots in it or anything. Once I'm in this position, I'm going back down again. So once again, choose another position, which is close to where you started, where those other stitches are. And then you should have just your tail and a small stitch on the top. With the needle again, I'm just going to point it back through, coming up fairly close to those other stitches and pulling it tight. So you've got two little stitches on the back, which you can feel with your finger. And then once we're in that position, we just take our scissors, wherever I've put them, and I'm going to cut the embroidery thread to about the same length as the, the tail I had left over. Now, what I like to do, these are probably quite generous ties, and as you get used to it, you will probably leave less because you will waste less in the, the long run, but whatever is easiest for you, to be honest. So I take both ties, both tails, Give them a little pull to make sure that the tie itself is tight. And then I'm just going to make a simple twist knot. So one over the other and then one through the hole like you would do, be tying a shoelace. And I usually do three. Three tends to be tight enough and I'm pulling each of them tight as I go. And then what you would then do is then snip the tails so they're quite short well, to be honest, whatever length you want to, short enough so that there's about half an inch, something like that, left 
which can just be your tails for your knot so that nothing's coming undone. But as you can see, that is the first tie. And if you needed to remove that tie, all you would do is on the back, you would snip through the stitches that are on the back of the quilt and that would enable you to release the tie. So let me show you the stitch on the back of the quilt now. We've got a couple of little stitches there in the back. It doesn't matter if they're pulled taut, that really doesn't matter. It's on the back and that's going to happen where you get that tightness in the stitch. So that's our very first hand tie and you can see how quick it is. So I've come in, I've put the quilt underneath my knee because I want to do this pink one here. This is my third one across on the edge. And I just wanted to get really close so that you guys could see what I'm doing. So I'm taking my needle and remember it's not knotted. I've just got a loose thread on it and I'm bringing it through, pulling it to the back side, and I'm gonna leave a small tail. Then holding that thread on the top, I'm just gonna pop my needle in until I find a position which is close enough to my original stitch, but isn't coming back up in the same hole. Then I pull, holding onto this one so it doesn't come all the way through. Now we're going back down again, so back down, and that should pull that loop down. Make sure your tail doesn't get caught like that. It should look like that at this stage. And then back up again in a slightly different position so that nothing comes loose. If it does come loose, if you accidentally come up in the same place, you will know because you'll suddenly feel the loss of that stitch. So now what we want to do is use our little scissors and snip the thread. You just want to have it long enough that you're not feeling as if you're struggling with your hands to tie those knots. So a simple one over the other and then bring one side underneath, but pulling it really tight at the same time. And then when you get to that point, you can simply trim your tails and there you are, another tie done. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there because it's gonna take me a while to get all those ties done on that massive quilt. But I want to show you what to do next once your quilt is at the stage where all your ties are done and you're ready to tidy up and do the binding. So I'm gonna show you how to tidy up, but I'm also gonna show you how I do my binding. So I've got this pretend quilt here. Do you like my pretend quilt? <laughs> It's just something we used to do when we had physical classes and it's an easy way of practicing doing binding without doing it on your big project, which is really complicated and really big. But you can have a little practice just on a bit of scrap fabric. It doesn't even have to be wadded. You just bind the outside of a scrap of fabric just to get practice at how the binding actually works and how to do those corners. So the first thing is you want to trim off any untidiness. So you've got your square edge of your quilt. So you've got that straight edge all the way around and you just want to cut the backing fabric and also the wadding so that you've got a neat edge going around all the way around the quilt. Once that is done and you've got all four sides nice and neat and tidy, one thing I like to do with my ordinary quilts um, as well as my EPP quilts is I like to sort of hold together these edges because as you can see, they do tend to flap and you can get bits tucked in underneath behind. So what I like to do is I like to go around with a big zigzag stitch right on the very edge of the quilt. And this, So if you do this zigzag stitch, it means that what you're doing is holding all the layers together for when you're putting your binding on. It means that you're not having to worry about trying to make sure all the layers are in when you've tucked it round and everything like that. You're just dealing with one thing that's connected. It's connected to itself. So I find that a lot easier. So if you like that, why don't you give that a try? It might make the whole binding process a little bit easier. So for binding, we always use this standard 25 millimeter binding. Um, you can make your own binding, but I quite like using the stuff that comes on massive rolls. <laughs> so what you need to do is measure out how much binding you need. 
And what you will need to do simply for that is to measure all the way around your quilt. Now you should have two sides which are the same length and another two sides which are the same length. So take those measurements and I would add on maybe half a metre, something like that, just to take into account the overlap that you need and also getting around those corners. You want to make sure you've got plenty because this stuff is really cheap and it's, it's it doesn't matter if you've cut off a good 10 inches because it's going to be worth it to make sure that you get all the way around without having to unpick it because it wasn't long enough in the first place. So get your binding ready and then I'll show you what to do next. So once you've got your trimming done, we need to take our bias binding and we're just going to open up one of those folded edges. So you can see that there's two folded edges in this traditional shop bought bias binding. So we're going to open up one of the edges and you can give it a press, but I just quite like scoring it with my thumbnail all along the whole length so that you're opening up that bias binding right the way along. Now, once you get to the very end, which might take a while, depending upon how big your quilt is, you'll have one edge opened up like that and the other edge is folded. So this open edge, this edge here, is going to go around the edge of your quilt. Now, I like to hand stitch my binding. I kind of do a combination of machine stitching on the first fold and then I hand stitch the other side. I'm going to show you that today um, just because that's how I like to finish it off, especially my English paper piecing quilts, because I'm not adverse to hand sewing. I actually, it's probably my favourite part of the whole process is hand stitching the binding on the back. So if you've hand sewn the whole quilt top, you might as well hand stitch the binding as well. We're going to take this raw edge and I'm going to start on the middle of one of the sides. It really doesn't matter. And ideally you want to be on the front of your quilt because this is going to be the neatest side because when you lay the binding on here, Eventually what you will do is you will stitch in the ditch along the edge of the binding and that will be with the machine. Then the whole thing will be turned and it will be folded to the back and the back will be hand stitched. Now, if you prefer to have your hand stitching on the front, that's absolutely fine. Just make sure that you do it the other way around so that your machine stitch is on the back of the quilt. So I'm leaving an overlap. So I'm going to leave a good three or four inches of overlap so that I can attach both ends of the binding together because the binding is going to come all the way around the quilt and then it needs to be joined where you started. So I'm lining up the edge of the bias binding with the edge of the quilt and I'm going to take my little clips. I've got these quilt clips. You can use hair clips as well. That's another really cheap option instead of using expensive quilt clips. But I find it's much easier than pins because they don't stab you as you're moving around. So we're just going to start by clipping there and then I'm going to clip again just as I get to the corner. Now, obviously you might have a very long expanse, so you want to use as many clips as you need to get all the way around. So what I've done is you can see that the bias binding is heading off in this direction. We've got, so we've got this lovely straight line and it's heading off across the table here, but actually we want to turn it so that it's coming down this edge. So the easiest way to do it is to take the bias binding and we're gonna fold it at a 45 degree angle until the corner is coming down and it's on top of itself. So as you can see the front of the bias binding at this point, but you can see that what we've done is we've changed direction. So with the, even though the direction is going this way, it is changed direction. So once you get this 45 degree angle and what the ideal thing is that you want the edge of the bias binding to be in the edge of the quilt. So it needs to be all be pointing into this direction. If it's something like this, you'll see that the angle isn't quite right. So what you're looking for is it being parallel with this line here. So you want it coming like that. Once you've done that, give it a little scrape with your fingernail. And then we're just going to flip it over so that it's coming back in the other direction again. 
So now we've got it running parallel with that side, but we just need to make sure that everything is lined up here. And the easiest way to do it is just to find the edge of the bias binding that's running this side, so along here, and just line it up with that. So you want to make sure that the edges are lined up and everything is kind of now tucked underneath. You've got this fold that is underneath. So you've got this triangle, but it's underneath the top of the bias binding. Once you get that in position, what you need to do is just pop a clip in to hold it in place like that. And then you would clip across just as you would, just as you had earlier right the way across, just before your corner. Okay, so I'm gonna show you one more corner. So we're gonna do it again. Unfortunately, quilts have four corners. So you've got to do it four times. This is why it's good to have a little practice piece because you can make as much mess with this and get your technique right before you start. So what we're doing is we're folding back the bias binding into a 45 degree angle so that it's pointing into the corner of the quilt. Once we've got that angle, it doesn't have to be exact. You can use your ruler, but I just kind of get try and get it right and then make my fold very clear with my fingernail. And then we're folding it back on itself so that it's coming in the other direction. Once that's in place, again, give it another little score with your fingernail and pop a pin or a clip in to hold it in place. So you need to go around the rest of the corners and then I'll show you how to join it. So there we are, I've got all four of my corners all done. The bias binding is clipped in place, but we haven't sewn anything yet. But the first thing we need to do is we need to join these two pieces together. So we've got two loose ends at the moment. So the easiest way that I find to do it is I like to take a fabric marker. Let me just get one. And we are going to mark on the binding where we're going to sew it together. So I'm going to use this middle line of stitching that I've got here as my marker. So what I'm doing with the first piece is I'm just folding it back on itself in parallel with that line. So I'm scored it with my finger, but I do find it very difficult to see those score lines when I need to be accurate with my stitching. So all I'm going to do is mark that with a marker pen. So that's the line where I folded it back into position there. And then I'm going to take the other piece. And if this one is really long, which mine is, um, which is fine, just give it a little trim before you start and leave yourself three or four, maybe five inches. It doesn't need to be any longer than that, but you don't want it being excessively long. There's no need for that at the moment. So once you get to this position, what you're going to do is you're going to fold the other one back so that they're butting up against each other as if they were sewn. So if they were sewn, they would be right next to each other and they would fit like that. So what I've done is I've given that one a little score with my finger and I'm gonna use my marker pen just to mark that again. So this is a fabric marker which will disappear with water, um, but also it's going to, your stitches are gonna be on top of it. So you could always just mark it with a little pencil or with chalk or whatever you want to do, okay? Once you've gotten to that point, what we need to do is we need to remember that to sew this together, we need to sew it at right sides together. So we're taking the right sides of both of these pieces and we're going to match them on those lines. So we're lining everything up so that both sides are right on top of each other. Both of the marked lines are right on top of each other. Then I'm going to take a pin and I'm going to pin both sides. I've left it as it was with one side opened up and the other side folded inside. So I'm just going to mark, I'm just going to pin both sides of that line. And then you can see that it's, it's pinned like that. And I'm going to stitch 
down that line. Just taking it with my sewing machine, I'm going to reverse at the beginning, reverse at the end, so it's nice and secure. Then I can trim off the edge and it should sit completely flat. So let me do that and I'll come back. So here we are, I've stitched it in place. I can take the pins out now and I'm going to trim off the excess. So I'm going to leave about an inch of uh, tail and then if I open the whole thing up again, you can see pulling out my seam allowances, that everything is now sitting flat on the quilt. So that's been a really successful join. Just trimming off my extra tails of thread and then you can clip your join in place. So this means that when you now stitch, you're stitching around the whole thing without doing having to worry about the join, the join's been done. So moving on to the stitching, to actually stitch the binding, I like to take each side separately. So I do one line of stitching going from the corner of one to the corner of the other, stopping and reversing at each side. And then I take it off the machine and then reset and do the next one. And I think that with something that's this big and bulky, if you've got a big quilt, it's much easier to do it that way. So let me show you the first side. So we'll use this side, which is closest to the camera. Um, I'm going to unclip this edge. And what you want to do is you want to bring your little fold here. So this little triangular fold that you have, you want to free that up. So what you want to do is you need to kind of untuck the, the part that's underneath and just let that move freely. So moving it out of the way so that it's not pinned. And if I can show you what you need to do, if I get a pin, you need to stitch from this side of the triangle. So you almost have a point where both triangles were meeting. So if I kind of mark it with my finger, you can see here. So this point here, you want to stitch from here right the way across to the same point on the other side. But we want to make sure that we don't stitch the fabric that's on this side that's coming down here. So we'll start by loosening this other side and then we will stitch with the reverse to begin with, right the way across, stitching in the ditch. And I just do a standard stitch, a standard straight stitch on my machine. I tend not to do anything else. If anything, I might increase the length of the stitch, just if it's a really bulky wadding that you've used or it's a really bulky quilt, it would just help it move slightly more smoothly through your machine. But these stitches are going to be hidden, so it doesn't matter if you've got tiny little stitches. So we're going to stitch from this corner right the way across to the other edge. And again, I'm going to release this clip when I get to it. And that just means that I can then release that fabric and I can stitch as close as I can into this little fold as I, as I need to without catching the other edge of the fabric. Then I'll, just, I'll do a reverse and stop there. I will then continue around the rest of the quilt. So let me stitch it and I'll show you how it looks when it's done. So we've got our bias bending all stitched on. Um, I've got a lovely orange thread, so you can see all the way around. And you can see I've got my reverse stitches at the beginning and at the end, just working my way around each of the sides. And it's easy on a little one like this. It definitely feels as if it's much less cumbersome than the big ones, um, but it's turned out fine. The first thing I do once I've finished is I flip it over and I just do a visual check all the way around to make sure I've caught all the layers, to make sure I've not come too close to the edge, it's maybe it's wavered off or anything like that all the way around, that it's nice and consistent and the stitches have caught all of the fabric. Now, one thing you may want to do is you may want to trim this edge a little bit. If you've used a particularly thick wadding or if you're if you don't think the bias binding will stretch over, you can give it a little test and you can see if you think it's going to stretch over and cover those edges and cover your stitches, then it should be fine. But I have found that sometimes I need to just take a little bit of that wadding out and you can just trim away with little scissors, little bits of the wadding or little bits of the backing fabric to make it sit more flush as you go around. <laughs> 
So once you've done that, let me show you how to do your hand stitching, how to fold everything to the other side. Right, so what we need to do is we need to bring our bias binding from the front and we want to give it a little tug, making sure it's kind of nicely pulled through on the other side of the quilt. And again, just use your fingers just to make sure everything is nice and flat and flush. And then we're folding the right side over. This is the side with the little fold already still in it. So you don't have a raw edge. You're just pulling the bias binding around to cover the raw edges of the quilt and the wadding and all your stitching and everything should be nice and neat inside. Again, if it doesn't quite stretch over, you need to do a little bit of trimming, that's perfectly fine. So I'm just gonna start clipping, using the same clips I used to attach the binding in the first place. Again, it's much easier than pins, especially if you don't get all the sewing done at the same time. You can pack it away without stabbing yourself too many times. So clip along one edge, and then you will get to your corner. And what I tend to do is I tend to flatten out the side that I'm already working on. So I flatten it out until I reach a little point. So this is where the fabric, the bias binding has changed direction. And once you reach that point, you can just fold it back in and you end up with this mitered corner. So it's really easy to do and you can manipulate it if it isn't sitting exactly as you want it to you can manipulate it. So just remember that it's your fabric, you're gonna make it bend to your will. <laughs> then I'm gonna come down here until I reach the point where I've got my join. And you can see that I've got one slightly untidy edge. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna pop a clip in it. And as I get to it with the hand stitching, what I'll do is I'll just make sure that I'm tucking that underneath and you can even fold it again out of the way so that you've got a nice, neat edge all the way around. Right, so that is the folding. That's doing the mitered corners, everything like that. You don't need to go around the whole of the quilt with the clips, especially if it's a big one. What I tend to do is I tend to do as much as I think I'm going to sew and I put those clips in. So if it's one side and a, couple, and a corner or two corners, then I clip that. And then as I'm sewing, I'm taking my clips out and then I can reclip again if I've got a bit more time. So now stitching, I've got an ordinary thread. This is just ordinary polyester thread or cotton thread, use whatever you already have and a standard needle. I've doubled it over and I've got a knot in the end. So I'm gonna show you how to stitch. So what I tend to do is I tend to start underneath the bias binding and underneath at the back of the quilt. So we're on the back of the quilt here, but I'm kind of aiming for that first stitch to be around about where my stitching is. So for the bias, attaching the bias binding. So I'm just going to make an initial stitch in there so it's out of the way. And this will take care of your knot. And it means that it's going to be completely hidden and you can get an anchoring stitch in before you need to start doing the actual stitches. I've done this in a yellow thread, hoping that you'll be able to see. And then what I do is I do a slightly diagonal stitch. So I'm taking a tiny bit of the quilt just where the bias binding meets the quilt. So I'm taking one or two threads of the quilt and then I'm just coming up at the very, very edge of the bias binding. And I hope you can see that. So it's this stitch that's going away from me the whole time. So I'm doing like that. Then another one, and you don't have to do these too closely together. You can be quite generous with it. I've never had a bias binding yet come away from it, from, from the quilt. So again, another few stitches up like that, another few threads coming like that. And you end up with these sort of parallel stitches, which are running along the edge of the quilt like that. And if you use a matching thread to your bias binding, you won't even see these stitches. So that's my tip. Don't use a contrasting thread unless you really want to show off your hand stitching. So you just keep going like that. I tend to always want to wrap it around my finger like that. I find it much easier 
to just, it kind of brings it to my eyesight as well. So I can see where I am popping it up like that and pulling the stitch through. So as we come up into this corner, what we want is we want the stitch, the next stitch we do to come underneath and come up on the opposite side of the bias binding that we're on at the moment. So I've left my clip in for the moment just so I can move it when I need to. And what we're going to do is we're just going to do a couple of anchoring stitches going across that fold. And obviously what we want to do is we want to hold down both pieces of the fold on either side of the bias binding and go across two or three times. The important thing is we don't want our stitches to go onto the front of the quilt. We want to make sure that they're just on the inside of the quilt and on this top edge here. So as you're going, if you have your fingers underneath and if you feel the needle or the thread coming underneath, you know you've gone too far. So I've done a couple of anchoring stitches and then my last stitch is going to be coming back down on the other side of the binding, just like this. And then I'm gonna come back up on the other side of the quilt, so over here, so that I can start stitching across this edge just like I'd done previously. So we're just gonna continue like that until all of the binding is stitched down in place. So that's it, that's all of the details that you need to get on with your EPP quilt and get it finished. And I hope that's explained how we go through each step thoroughly so that you know exactly what you're doing. It's been really lovely talking to you today, even though you're not actually here, but I feel like I've been chatting away to someone all day and it's been lovely to produce this video for you. I would really love to see some of your quilts. So if you've been making one for a while, please send us a, as a picture. You can email it to mail at stitchsisters.co.uk or just tag us on Instagram or on Facebook. But if you are looking for a new hobby, then English paper piecing is a really lovely thing to do at home. All you need is a little bit of cotton fabric, leftover scraps and some paper, a needle and thread and you're ready to go. So thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.